order. We're here today for the Education Environment Sustainability Meeting, February 1st, 2023. Can we have a roll call, please? And just as a reminder to all who are in attendance, this meeting is being recorded and live streamed on the county's YouTube page. Calling the roll, Ms. Simon? Here. Ms. Stevens? Ms. Stevens is absent. Mr. Jones? Mr. Jones is absent. Mr. Schron? Mr. Schron is absent. Ms. Conwell? Present. There is not a quorum. Also, like the record to reflect that Council Member Miller is in attendance. Thank you. Any public comment? No, Madam Chair, no one is signed in. We're going to hold the minutes from January 18th because we don't have a quorum. There's no specific legislation referred to committee. However, we do have a, a, a presentation and update on first um, Lights Out Cleveland is going to talk about the, um, the Lights Out program and how that interplays with county buildings. And then we'll hear from um, the Convention Center, Global Center people. So we're going to start off with um, Lights Out Cleveland. Councilman Tron is um, joining us. Well, thank you. Um, so do you want, should I put on the power? Yeah, it's on. Yep. I'm Tim Jasinski. I work at Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. I'm a wildlife rehabilitation specialist there. Okay. And if you want, you can start off with your presentation with the PowerPoint. Okay. So I put a little bit of presentation together to give a little bit of background about what Lights Out Cleveland is. It's a collaborative effort um, between a few different organizations to reduce window collisions on migrant songbirds in downtown Cleveland. Um, uh, light and glass pose a huge risk to our native songbirds. Um, and uh, these birds are uh, migrants. These aren't birds that are um, here year round. These guys are just kind of stopping through um, from the Borough Force of Canada down to the you know South America and other parts of the world. Um, here's a here's a little graph, kind of just from 2019 data that we uh, put together. Um, Ohio Bird Conservation Initi Initiative is the the group based out of Columbus that kind of oversees all the um, lights out efforts in Ohio. And you can see how Cleveland is a huge numbers compared to other cities. Um, there's a couple of different reasons for that. One reason is that we're right on the lake, and the lake is a very important stopover uh, point for these migrant songbirds, as well as uh, a huge barrier with the lake being there um, and all the, the city and the lights that are, um, that are here. Um, what happens, most of these songbirds migrate at nighttime. So they're flying over, uh, the, you know, following the stars and the moon, other things that we don't understand. And when they get to a city with a lot of light, um, they're somehow attracted to that white light for some reason. And um, we don't really understand why, just kind of moths at like your porch light, kind of similar thing where they fly into the city and they make night flight calls, which kind of excites the birds and they kind of draw together um, and, uh, and they collide with windows. Um, here's some data that we put together for the last, uh, since 2017 is when we started this. Um, we've always know this, known this was a problem with these birds hitting windows um, because, you know, as a rehab center, we get calls about birds that are downtown Cleveland, um, and uh, we don't have the resource to pick up animals typically, but we designed this program in 2017 to really see what's happening in our cities, uh, in our city, and we didn't realize how, how much it was going to be. Uh, we still have to put some data together, but there's over 14,000 birds collected uh, since 2017 down there. Um, on average, about 3,000 birds a year are collected. There's more in the fall because there's young birds coming th through from their first their first breed, you know, uh, first year of bo being born, um, and just my migration patterns are different and stuff. But um, typically, in the in the spring, we get around we collect around 800 birds, live and dead, and then around 2,500 or so in the fall. Um, and every year is different, but that's kind of an average amount. And what we found is that most of these collisions happen near green space. So the more plants and trees and habitat you have, uh, it's good for the birds because these birds need that, you know, for their refueling their systems when they're coming down, uh, you know, after flying all night long. Um, but it poses a huge risk to these birds when you're right next to glass. So um, birds don't understand the concept of glass. They uh, they don't they didn't they don't evolve with that. They don't know what it is. So there's two reasons why they hit glass. One is that they're attracted to the lights that are inside the building at nighttime when it's dark. So, you know, downtown's pretty dark in the, in the morning, and then the, the buildings are lit up, so they, they're attracted to that light, and they hit the glass because of that. 
but also once it gets dawn and they're, they're going to try to find their way they're, where they're going now, get some food, um, they hit reflective glass. So, you know, they see it as an extension of the habitat, not actually a, a mirrored image. And so they hit the glass and fall. So most collisions happen right at dawn, but typically they happen really throughout the day, but most of it is from, from pre-dawn to a little bit after dawn. Um, there's a lot of questions uh, regarding if these birds are the local birds, like pigeons, house sparrows, starlings. But actually, most of the birds we're collecting are neotropical migrants that don't really stay here for the, for the, the, the summer season. They're, they're up in the Bora Forest of Canada breeding all the way up to Alaska. And so um, we, do, we rarely get house sparrows. So those are the ones that you see typically year-round hopping around down here, uh, the non-native species. We don't really collect those ever. Uh, they just evolved with glass because they're not from here. They're from Europe. Uh, so they just, they live in our cities. So the ones that are hitting the glass are these neotropical migrants, these beautiful warblers. These are all warblers here. Um, and so it's, it, there's, a, I mean, I think we've over 180, 190 species we've collected so far. Um, so a team of volunteers. So we start at 5 a.m. Um, from March 15th through the beginning of June. And August 15th through around mid-November is when most of the birds are going to be migrating through Ohio. So we get a team together. Um, we walk around the streets of Cleveland, uh, and we, we monitor certain buildings uh, from where we found a lot of collisions at, um, and we just walk around the buildings over and over and over again. So, you know, we'll get there at 5 o'clock in the morning, walk around one building. You know, that take, might take 10, 15 minutes, and we come back around. So we, we, uh, we record what species we find, uh, the date that the bird was collected, the time, um, and the side of the building and what building it is. So we have all that data. So when all the birds come to Lake Erie Nature and Science Center, both dead and alive, we have uh, volunteers and staff that, mo that process those birds so we know exactly how many we get each year of how many species, and that goes into a database. So like I mentioned before, you know, if the city is dark, uh, which is the whole goal of Lights Out Cleveland is to reduce, you know, um, uh, exterior lighting that, you know, isn't needed for safety um, and also, uh, you know, trying to treat glass. Um, that really helps out with the, these songbirds to, to continue their migration. Um, there are dead bird photos in here, so I just want to let people know that that's going to be coming up soon. Um, but weather is a huge uh, factor with these birds as well when they're migrating. So um, often we'll have over a million, 2 million, 15 million birds flying over Cleveland at nighttime in one night migration. Um, if you have a, a low pressure system that can actually affect the birds' migration, they'll come down into the city and kind of drop before they, they, need, they really want to. And then they're really trapped in the city because there's all that low, you know, low pressure. They'd be, they're flying lower, so they're more prone to being trapped into the city. Um, and, and that can cause a lot of issues. Um, like I was saying before, here's a good examples of, you know, buildings that are lit up at nighttime um, that really attract the birds. So they're, uh, they're attracted to that light for some reason. So you can see one of my volunteers capturing a bird at the window there because they'll flood up against the window trying to get in. <clears throat> Another thing that, that we have found is that, you know, they want to feed in trees. Typically, most of these birds are feeding on insects. And so um, when you have either habitat on the inside or the outside, you know, they think they can get into that tree from the tree that's right behind the photo here. So as they're traveling, they hit that glass and, and then and they collide with the, the window. Um, we found that the larger the windows, the more chance you have of collision. So um, small little kind of windows like these here probably aren't too much of an issue. Um, it's usually the first two floors that are the problem um, areas. And uh, just the larger the window, the more reflection, the more, the more issues you have typically, specifically around green space. Um, so public square has awesome green spaces, a lot of trees and bushes and plants, and that's a good, you know, draw for the birds, but also can be bad at the same time. There it goes. So you can see the, the reflection there um, in the morning. Um, we actually had a wild turkey found at that building specifically last, last fall, and that's just, I couldn't believe when my team told me that. I'm like, a wild turkey? Are you serious? And they collected and brought the bird in, and it was a female wild turkey. Don't know where she came from, maybe Cleveland Lakefront, but... Uh, so you can see there's a lot of habitat downtown. Um, this is the mall drive in between uh, Lake, Lakeside and Superior, or Lakeside and uh, St. Clair, but that's actually just glass. That wasn't actually, um, uh, that's a re that was a reflection. So you can see kind of collisions happen year round. This female wood duck was just found just a few days ago by one of my volunteers that works down here. Um, but we often find uh, birds around, along these, these glass mirrors um, down there because it's, kind of perfectly set in the, in the habitat for these birds. 
<clears throat> um, so here's some photos that we took along the way. We use these for presentations like this and documenta documenting the species. Um, there's some uh, Lincoln sparrows there, um, some golden crown kinglets, uh, a, a song sparrow. You can see this is after we collect the live birds. So when we're monitor monitoring building, you know, our my goal as a wildlife rehabilitator is to collect the live ones first, get them safe, uh, get them into a paper bag, collect the data, then we collect the dead birds. So there could have been four or five birds on, on this window here um, initially, and then we go through and collect the, the deceased birds. Um, you can see just the, the reflection and, and you know, in, be, in behind these, uh, this uh, beautiful black burning warbler there that was killed in spring of 2018, I believe. <clears throat> so, um, you know, like I said, these birds are not, uh, they don't understand glass. So when they're flying at nighttime, they fly a little bit slower uh, and they're just, you know, kind of disoriented because they would want to keep going. Um, but the city kind of lights kind of bring them down and they're, they're real prone to these collisions. Um, we've had, I think I said, uh, over 190 species, I think, of, of birds collected. Um, this northern sawwood owl was, was uh, killed uh, two years ago. A uh, very common bird that we collect is a white-throated sparrow. Um, American woodcock are another bird we collect a lot of. And a lot of these birds are uh, special interest and species of concern in North America. So their populations are already on the decline because of cats and habitat loss and pesticides. And window collisions is, is, uh, is second to cats in North America for, or in the United States specifically for bird mortality. Um, so there's more sparrows. We get a lot of sparrows in the fall. Um, many, many different species. Um, and so you can see here that uh, the building on the right-hand side, there was at least eight or nine dead, dead birds on that window as a volunteer uh, moved through and was checking buildings. Um, and there were some live ones, too, that she collected, too. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see there was, a, there was four birds in the, the photo. There's one to the right, too, that, was, uh, that was, were rescued. <clears throat> um, and I said, most of these are all neotropical migrants. Wood thrush are a species of concern. Um, you know, we had a lot of hummingbirds last year, a lot of chickadees last year. Um, so we have a team down there that uh, we, I train them how to capture these birds safely. So we catch them in these nets um, and, you know, we carefully pick them up in what's called the banders grip and, and place them into paper bags. Um, and then we take them to Lake Erie Nature and Science Center where they're rehabilitated and, you know, with the goal of releasing them. That bird on the right there is one of the, the icon birds for Lights Out Cleveland because most people don't know what they are. Uh, they, we get a lot of them down here, um, and uh, they're a very, very unusual bird. That's that's uh, it's it's a, it's a species of concern in Ohio. Um, we photographed the birds. That's me photographing a, a grasshopper sparrow there, um, with uh, my, one of my friends uh, holding a common yellow throat uh, warbler there. So we get them in bags. We collect collect the live ones, add dead ones in bags. They come back to the center. We let them rest for a little bit, um, and uh, we administer medications. And we have cages set up. We have you know. 15, 20, 30 cages already prepped for the, for the day because on average, um, two thirds of the birds are dead that we find. Um, but that third that's still alive is hopefully we can, you know, re release those guys back in the wild. So we have a really great track record with rehabilitation at our center. Um, and we're really proud of our uh, re release recovery rates. And, uh, so typically we'll get on average in a fall day, cause fall is busier than spring, anywhere from 30 to 70, 80, 150 birds live a day. Um, that we collect and we have to restart it over the next day. So it's, it's, it's definitely a, an issue for sure. We also collect bats down here, a lot of bats. Um, bats are um, very, very threatened in Ohio and North America because of white nose syndrome. It's a fungus that's, that's, that's kind of collapsing their populations. And so every bat that we can save is very, very important. So all the bats get transferred to Penitentiary Glen Wildlife Center in Kirtland where they continue the rehabilitation and are released in a safe area. Um, this is just one day of collisions in uh, October 26, 2017. Um, we had 255 birds that day collected, um, and uh, it was just a wild day. There was birds, we had a low pressure system, and birds were just moving. Um, really, we were collecting birds past 1, 2 o'clock that day. It was, it was unbelievable that day. Um, so is there any questions about what we, you know, our data or anything? Thanks so much, Tim. A uh, question from committee members? Councilwoman. So through the chair, what do you do with the uh, de deceased birds? Where do you relocate them? So the deceased birds are sent to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History for their research collection. Currently, there's no one in ornithology that's accepting birds. It just happened recently. But in the past, all these birds were transferred to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History 
where they're conducting really important research on these, these specific birds. They were taking wing cord, age, sex, weight, um, any ectoparasites, endoparasites, and publishing a lot of interesting papers about these birds. Uh, one paper specifically that they wrote with uh, Ben Winger up in, the, uh, in Michigan is that they learned through what we're finding with these birds is a lot of these birds we find make night flight calls. So as they're flying and migrating, they're making little chip notes. And uh, we find a lot of those birds, like thrushes, sparrows, warblers, kinglets, make those night flight calls. But certain birds, like flycatchers and vireos and tanagers, don't. We don't get many of those. So there was a theory that those birds that make night flight calls um, are calling and they're, they're excited, they're nervous, they're, they're chipping, they're chipping, and it's actually bringing other birds from a little bit farther out into uh, downtown. So um, it's a really interesting uh, thing that we can learn from all this data that we have versus the live birds and versus the dead birds. Um, so, uh, you know, they're, they're in, uh, doing a lot of really important research on, on the even after the bird dies, which is very unfortunate. We can still learn from that and, and try to use, uh, you know, conservation methods to, to help these species. My next question would be um, in terms of who are you reaching out to in terms of office buildings or whatever? Maybe there's some kind of windows or special windows that can be put on lower. That's a very loaded question. I'm a rehabilitator, and I take you know I take care of the sick and injured birds. But Matt Schumar with Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative, and Harvey Webster, retired chief wildlife officer for Cleveland Museum of Natural History, uh, talks to building owners and managers and and encourages them to reduce lighting uh, that's not needed for safety, and also address any um, glass that is reflective that you can put treatments on. It's much cheaper to in uh, early stages, uh, use birds friendly glass in buildings and new construction. Um, but then uh, if the building is already constructed, there are ways that you can use uh, window films or little treatments that are little, uh, you know, fritted dots that go on the outside of the window and that breaks up the reflection and then the birds don't hit it. So it's a huge, huge success. Um, Cleveland State University um, put uh, treatment on one of their, uh, the, the, um, the law building um, and we had no collisions after that when we were monitoring that building, uh, there were a lot of collisions there. I don't have the numbers offhand, but a lot of birds were hitting there and being killed. And since that treatment went up, not one bird was found there. So it's certainly very effective. And that's the whole hope is um, if we could reduce lighting, that will help. But then, you know, we do need to address the glass if we can and any treatments that we put on windows, specifically uh, the first, you know, 10 buildings that are, um, you know, really high number volume birds found would be huge to, to success for this program. I would say make a partnership with uh, people that do lead safe buildings. Yes. Yeah. Start having the conversations. Yeah. Thank you. And and part of the reason we're here today, and I'm going to have um, Tim explain about unless um, the council yeah. has questions, but part of the discussion I wanted to, to center around our county buildings, which include um, Justice Center, um, Global Center, Mall C events, which... Um, I'm going to defer to my colleague for questions, but I definitely want to come back to talk about the data you have related to those two areas. Mm -hmm. And I understand, thank you, Madam Chairman, uh, Chairwoman, the, uh, her point about the buildings we control. What about all the other buildings? Where's the city of Cleveland in regards to this whole concept? Because obviously they're the ones that you say uh, lights off Cleveland. That, that kind of indicates to me that that's, the, that's your target audience. Yeah, so what, what have they said to you at this point in time in your presentations? So um, we're still kind of in the early stage of Lights Out Cleveland. So 2017 was a couple years ago, but it takes – every city is different. Um, when Chicago started this in, two, in 1995, the mayor was on board right away and, and you know, kind of got with it and, 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 you know, worked with the building managers. But it's been a little slower process in Cleveland. Um, we do have many buildings. If you go to Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative website, they have a list of all the buildings that are participating in Lights Out Cleveland, and that means that they, they, they know that – Collisions are a problem in our city, and they know that you know we want to reduce that. So uh, you know I'm on board, and I want to try to help. Um, and so um, you know that's not my part of it, is talking to building owners and managers. But um, you know Cleveland is a you know is a is a really great place for 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 bird. If you're a birder and you love nature, I mean Cleveland is a great place. So the lakefront with Wendy Park and Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve and the Emerald Necklace around us is a great place for for these birds to stop over. And and the city does pose a huge issue. So um, it could be any building. It could be a large you know tower or it could be a small building with just a couple windows and uh, any way that they could they could help and try to reduce collisions is is you know our hopes when, when that was done in Chicago was that done by 
volunteerism from the building owner, or was it done by mandate from a governmental body? I don't think it. I'm not sure if it was mandates, but I know that the that the the mayor said, "Hey, let's do this. Let's let's help these songbirds." And and what they found is that pre-collision data and post lights out data. Um, there was an 80% reduction in collisions in the city. So, uh, you know, before the lights were turned out and dimmed, it was 100 birds hitting a window, and then bef after that, it was only 20. So that's a huge, considerable distance when, or uh, you know, difference when you're, when this many birds come through in Cleveland. Like I said, is a really we're right in a, a migratory pathway here, and so it's um, amazing what species we can see here in Cleveland. So, and I don't know whether or not you're going to hear the flip side from the police authorities and things of that nature, but they always argue on the other side that lights help provide safety for, uh, for the street and activity and helps eliminate or mitigate at least some gang activities and things of that nature. How, how do you respond? Certainly, um, and, and that's why I mentioned before that you know, we, we don't want the city dark where you can't see. Um, we, we certainly want um, safety lighting out there, but what we're really um, hoping for is the exterior um, lighting on buildings that make the, like the, like the towers light up or just any extra lighting that's not needed for safety to be reduced, um, and that really helps in the the, the re light reduction for to these birds to continue migrating. It's really it's it certainly helps. So when the terminal tower gets lit up at night, that's uh, that's a magnet to draw 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 the birds. That it is safely. certainly yeah. Um, you know I, I monitor myself down there. Um, and, you know we're all volunteers doing that, and I'll walk the streets with everybody. And and uh, you know when you have a, a night of migration that's that's pretty heavy, you can actually see the birds circle in the building in the in the in the beam lights going up. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, you know it, there's a huge. Um, um, uh, situation in 9/11 uh, towers there the the, the two uh, tribute uh, lights yep. um, that's that's uh, causes issues for the songbirds so they have uh, bird groups there that will monitor the amount of birds and if there's once that gets to too many birds up in those lights they'll extinguish your lights for a certain amount of time release the birds and give it a certain time for them to kind of keep going before they put the lights back on so it's definitely it's just it's something that they're attracted to for some reason interesting and you indicated I think you said like we get one to two to three million birds coming through the areas. I think it's the, what percentage of, and I know you hate to, hate to boil things down to percentage, but what percentage of deaths in regards to the number of non-deaths, so we'll go the other way, uh, or non-collisions uh, take, would you consider this to be? Is this a 5%, 2%? Uh, it sounds like it's pretty, I hate to, I hate to be, be boiling it down to that, but it seems like as a percent of what your, your, your numbers were, it seems like it's a fairly low percentage, even though every death is... It's tragic. It is. So every death is tragic, and, and I don't know the numbers. I was never good at math in school, um, but I know that every every bird in that population matters. And so if you have, you know, we've lost um, a, a considerable amount of our bird population since uh, the 70s, and I think it's 25% of our bird population is gone and not coming back. Um, and so if you had 100,000 birds, now there's 75,000. So it's a huge, um, it's definitely, it's, a, it's not good. And, and the more things are changing, um, the, the, the population is going down. Um, and so this is why we, you know, bird organizations and, and rehabilitators like myself are really trying to get the word out that this is a problem. And, and you know, uh, many people don't know it's a problem. I mean, most of the birds are, are colliding with the windows pre-dawn and right at dawn. And you have a lot of, we're right on Lake Erie and there's a lot of gulls here. And the gulls actually she learned to patrol the buildings and, and eat all the birds that are injured or dead um, as they're flying by. It, I've actually you you watch them circle the buildings, um, and they know that that's a food source. So um, there's we, the numbers that we collect here are highly um, uh, uh, not accurate for what actually is probably hitting those windows um, throughout the day and my, during migration seasons. Um, you know, because we collect on average 3,000 birds a year, but there's way more than that that are colliding that, that we're not getting to. Um, we don't have enough, either we don't have enough people or when we're on one side of the building, a bird hits and a gull comes out and grabs it and, and uh, we, rats eat, um, eat the birds too. Um, uh, squirrels eat them. So uh, there's a lot of scavengers that also uh, will, will eat them. Along with building, um, you know, crew that that go up and do cleanup and stuff, they'll they'll clean up the birds as well. So um, the numbers that we're collecting are not actually really um, showing the actual number of what are uh, what are colliding with the windows. So to answer your question, I mean, you know, the amount of birds that are migrating over it's 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 immense. It really is. But um, if you look at conservation wise. If we don't pay attention to this problem, it's going to continue to happen, and the numbers are going to continue to decline as they already are in a faster rate, and it could be bad for these birds. I mean, it's it's it wouldn't won't be good long term. Does it matter whether it's on the? I I, I was thrilled about your report on the, the law school. 
and its success uh, yeah. with the with the dot matrix pattern on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I assume that that's what my uh, uh, chairwoman is, is going to advocate for council buildings uh, for our county buildings, which mm -hmm. we can control and we can spend the money. And, yeah. Uh, from that standpoint, does it matter whether that is is uh, on the north side or because the birds? I would assume when you, you say migrate, that means they're coming from north to south. Uh, do you does the does the building owner have to put it on all four sides of the building? That's an excellent question. And um, initially, we thought that that like you were thinking that in the spring, the birds would come from the south. They'd be hitting that south facing uh, right. a, a building. But actually, um, there's more collisions on the the larger the window and the more habitat you have nearby. That's where they're having a collisions at. So when we had this collision data, when Sunny reached out to us and said, "Hey, you know what? What are you finding downtown?" You know, I could tell you exactly what side of the building. Yeah. Um, is is the worst, and so you know we want to obviously work with the city and and the county to uh, to treat what windows are are really being affected. So you don't want to treat a window that there's no birds being found at or very little, you know, because obviously that costs money. And we all you know you know want to pay attention to that. Um, so we have the data and the knowledge of of where the treatment should be put, and um, and just from our previous data of knowing where these birds are found. Is there an alternative that has been found? I mean. Um our chairwoman has found some alternatives in regards to deer and gulling in versus uh, neutering. Uh, is there any kind of other uh, alternative like a sound or a flash or any, any kind of, uh, of, of alternatives to, that, uh, that doesn't require that? Uh, or, or even stream, if, if they follow the stream of light, can you, can you have the stream of light going in a direction that it, it, that is non-confrontational and it, it moves them away from the windows? Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. So any lighting that's that's facing downward is going to be less obstructive to the birds than lights going up. Um, and so any of the beams that are going up alongside the buildings that you know that reaches the sky and and, and so that will attract the birds. So, so lights that are that are downward facing are better than lights that are going up. Um, there's no um, information that I know of that would deter the birds. Um, but, you know, when these birds are migrating, they're tired, they're going to stop. And like I said, we're at a great place for migration here in Cleveland. There's a lot of habitat here. Um, we call them migrant traps, just a little small area of habitat that's, that's, that these birds need to refuel. Most of them are insect eaters, so they're, they're, you know, they're eating tons of insects, bugs, worms, things like that. So they're going to stop into these green spaces like Erie Street Cemetery and, and the Mall B up there and, and, uh, and, and uh, Public Square and, and feed and, and, you know, and try to refuel. But unfortunately, they're surrounded by a bunch of glass. So um, it would be uh, if the birds stopped over there um, and the glass was treated or the lightings were, lighting was low, it would be less collisions overall. And that's what other cities are, are demonstrating with what's lights out programs that are that are effective so on your you just gave us a graphic of, of a bunch of buildings and gave us uh, collisions mm -hmm. so if we were to identify five five of the of the worst offending buildings and did something we would actually be able to track data to see whether that had it was impactful absolutely and so yeah so that would be post collision data so yeah if we if we treated uh, you know the five ten major buildings that that we find a lot of birds at um, we would continue to monitor those buildings uh, after the treatment's up, and we would have a uh, a good idea of to prove that this is actually effective. And and you know, saw, seeing what happened at the law building there at CSU, I'd be super happy to see less birds brought into the center. You know, because it is very sad to see a you know a, a prothionary warbler um, hit a window and fall right in your hand. I mean, there's days that we're down there that birds are hitting and falling on you as you're collecting other birds, and it's pretty emotional. So, you know, anything we could do to reduce these collisions, I mean, we're all for it. Thank you. You've been very informative. Thank you, Thank Councilman. You. Um, additional question, and Councilman Miller? Yes. Uh, my question is about Rocket Market Fieldhouse, which I saw as number one on the list, and... and uh, do we have any information as as to whether the uh, the renovation that was done made it better or made it worse? And 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 do you know if when they did that renovation that they, whether or not they paid any attention to these issues? Because that was done relatively recently. 
It was done recently, and um, there are way more collisions after the renovations were complete. Um, it's um, it, you know it's a beautiful building. It looks great, but it's it's a it's a very very tall wall of glass, and it's very reflective. Um, we our collaborators are working with the folks over at um, Rocket Mortgage to try to reduce collisions. We we met with them early in the fall to try to see what we can do with lighting and things like that. So uh, they are willing to work with us, and we've been talking to them, which is great because sometimes when we reach out to places, uh, they they are unwilling to work with us or just, you know, we don't hear back. So, um, you know, that's just kind of part of how it goes. But they're very nice folks over there, and they do want to help. They, they know it's a, uh, an issue there. Uh, and so we are working with them to see what we can do to, to prevent collisions there in the future. Okay. Well, it, based on the numbers, it certainly, certainly needs our attention. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I wanted to ask you specifically, we're here today, we have um, Global Center folks here and talk about the Mall B and C mm -hmm. and those vents and the Global Center and what your findings are. Yeah, so I believe the Global um, global Health Center, the east side of the building there is uh, the, the fifth um, largest collision uh, problem that we have downtown. Um, you know, like Rock and Mortgage is number one and, and number five is global. And the reason why we think that is, is because it's, it's a large pane of glass. It's very reflective and it's, it, it's directly ne next to and adjacent to incredible habitat for a lot of these birds. So there's a lot of trees, a lot of bushes, a lot of grasses, and it, that's a, that's great to have. But when you have that, that many, you know, um, habitat directly next to glass, it's definitely, uh, can cause an issue. What about the vents? Vents, the same thing. The vents are actually uh, a little bit worse because they are um, s completely mirrored imaged. It's a, it's a mirror, um, and it's directly inside the habitat, so that makes it even worse because, um, you know, while the Global Health Center, the east side of that, that facade there is next to habitat, it's not in it. So when you have those vents that are inside all those different planters, mm -hmm. the birds are moving from planter to planter, and they, they, don't, they don't know the... Uh, that so you know you can again my my uh, draw or the photo there you could definitely see even you would look at it and see that's thinking that's just an extension of the habitat but it was a mirror image so yeah that's a, definitely a problem. Okay, I really appreciate it, and I'm I'm you know the the question was you know why does this matter and you talked about the mass extinction and the study that came out about the reduction in the bird population yeah. is just it's, it's um, staggering the loss and it's uh, you know this is not only critical to the birds but it's to the ecosystems that everybody lives within. It's not just one species. If you get rid of one, it impacts everybody else on the planet in some way. So, um, and these birds you said are coming from Canada, but we're, how far south do they go, Tim? So that's a good question. So some are long distance migrants and some are short distance migrants. So, you know, uh, a good example is a black pole warbler. It's a little warbler that we get a lot of, uh, mostly in the fall. Uh, they breed up in Alaska and the northern parts of Canada. And in the fall, they, they make a southeast migration to the coast they double their body weight by the time they get there. So they're usually around 12 grams. They get to the coast and they're about 24 grams. They fly straight out in the middle of the ocean, nonstop flying in the middle of the ocean. Uh, and then they pick up the northwest trade winds that take them straight down to Venezuela in a nonstop flight of 48 hours. So that little songbird is flying nonstop, sun up, sun down, sun up, sun down. At a huge, that's insane. I mean, you talk about like athletes with the football players and stuff. I don't think about sports, but you know, you have that, and that is an athlete. That's insane to me. And so, these birds are making these these amazing migrations. And some of these birds are breeding in Alaska and migrating all the way to the tip of South America um, in just a couple days' flight. Uh, some only go to southern states like Tennessee, like the chunky woodcock there with the long beak that we see do down here very frequently. Those go to the southern states, sometimes Texas, but usually Alabama, Tennessee, things like that. And we actually have post collision data on some of those birds. We're working with bird researchers to put uh, tags and transmitters on our, our released birds, and we can actually see where they're going by this little backpack that they have on. And so we can prove that not only our rehabilitation is working, but where these birds are stopping over, what habitat they're using, and where they're going. So um, it, it's really incredible. I mean, ruby throated hummingbirds, we get a lot of them down here. Um, they, they fly straight over the Gulf of Mexico, a little three gram hummingbird nonstop flies straight over that at nighttime. It's incredible. Okay. Thank you so much. No problem. It's, appreciate it. Okay, so now we're going to have folks from Global Center, Convention Center Bureau. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Is your mic on? Sorry. 
Good afternoon. My name is Ron King. I'm the general manager of uh, for ASM Global, the management company of the convention center um, here in Cleveland. Uh, and, and, and I appreciate the, the, um, the, number one, I appreciate the opportunity to give you an update on where we are uh, with our efforts. And number two, I appreciate the, the uh, presentation that actually saves me a lot of time in my presentation, uh, knowing what Lights Out has done. Uh, just as a quick timeline, in uh, 2017, we actually became members of uh, Lights Out. The, the, Mr. Sharon, you asked that question earlier. Uh, uh, Lights Out did reach out to us and made us aware that we had some issues. Uh, since that time, we've made strategic efforts to minimize our lighting footprint at night in coordination with Ohio Lights Out. Um, fast forward to 2022, we really hadn't heard much. And then we were actually made aware from uh, Council Member uh, Sonny Simon that there were uh, uh, continuing to have issues with bird strikes. Uh, we met with leadership of uh, the Cuyahoga County Convention Facilities Development Corporation. Also, I'll just call it the CCC FTC from here on out as, as it's shorter. Um, and with their board uh, to let them know of these issues. Uh, additionally, in October, we had a conversation with Ohio Lights Out Matthew Schumar, who is the program co coordinator for Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative in conjunction with the Ohio State University School of Environmental and Natural Resources. They were able to provide to us a spreadsheet that highlighted the birds collected, uh, some of which were re rehabilitated, released surrounding the exterior of the convention center campus. And as reported earlier, uh, it does appear that the vast majority of bird strikes are in the area where the mir mirrored black air intakes are located on the east side of the malls. Um, in November, uh, we toured Cuyahoga Community College to see examples of the bird film in use. Uh, in 2023, in early January, we have uh, requested an update of impact information from Ohio Lights Out to ensure we had the most accurate and up-to-date data as possible. Uh, we were also notified at that time that the spring Lights Out season will start March 15th, which coincides with the beginning of spring migration season. Uh, in mid-January, we did uh, take a tour of Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse, which was, which was brought up earlier today, to understand what their mitigation techniques are and, and to see uh, what their success rate is. Uh, at the request of the CCC FTC leadership and board, we hired a consultant, uh, Heath Waldorf, at uh, Bird Control Advisory. Uh, Mr. Waldorf has over 20 years' experience as an expert in bird safe strategies. Some of his clients include Newark International Airport, Kansas City International Airport, Denver in International Airport, and Disney's New York headquarters. The scope of uh, BCA will provide, includes examination of data provided by Lights Out, examine the existing site conditions of existing structures, as well as the plans for the uh, renovation of the ballroom and the addition. Uh, he's going to set up a uh, set of priorities and assist with the development of an RFP to implement, implement bird mitigation approaches to be presented to the CCC FTC leadership and board for consideration. He's also going to assist us in the bid process and bid comparisons. And in fact, Mr. Waldorf will be on site tomorrow uh, to conduct his evaluation. We expect his report within the next two to three weeks, at which time we will forward to the CCC FTC leadership and board. And that's where we are with things at this point. Welcome, any questions? Okay, thank you. Questions, Councilman Tron? Yes, sir. Have we found whether the type of light, whether it be incandescent or whether it be a digital, uh, and uh, because I, I assume, uh, as a matter of fact, I, I know that the, the various different light sources have different spectrums as far as what any of us see. Does any of that have impact as far I as whether it's um, you know, you can go to the, the neutral light, you can go to sunlight, you can go to uh, warm lights, and does any of that, I mean... I, I don't have that information, I don't know. I don't think anybody, and I'm, I'm just, it just seems to me that technology, there ought to be a place for technology to play a role in this thing, too. Uh, sorry, but you can't, you can't talk from back there. At home you can, but not here. <laughs> Sorry about that. This is all new to me. So, um, yeah, so we found that uh, just through the collision data of all the different organizations throughout the United States and around the world that the birds are for some reason attracted to the white lights yep. more than other lights. So red lights and green may not be as attracted uh, to them uh, as the white lights are. So uh, when you have tower lights on and they're red, the, the, the birds aren't as much affected. So the white light, these incandescent lights are, are certainly uh, the, the number one drawing uh, to, to the birds. And that's the cheapest one to put in for a building renovation. So right. we, all, we all do this. This is the light you're going to see. Right. But they have all, I mean, we're in the process of my own building, 
converting to digital, uh, one, it's environmentally, it, it, it's, lost, it's less of a demand, and uh, the light can be, can be feathered uh, yeah. Very easily. No, oh, shoot. That was a dumb word. Why not? This, this conversation. It can be adjusted uh, so that uh, uh, that you can you can kill the spectrum of another dumb word. Um, you can change the spectrum on it so that uh, uh, it because humans have the, have some of the same problems. Yep. If we're in the wrong light spectrum, uh, it can affect our performance in the day. And so we're looking at that from our end. I just didn't know whether that is, is something we're having these conversations about. Uh, um, I always hate to doing it to what we consider to be a new building. It's not really a new building any, anymore, but uh, are there, do we have the wrong lights in there? Do we have the wrong light pattern? Do we have the, I mean, uh, that would be, all be worthwhile to me. Uh, so we, if we're going to make a, if we're going to be a test site for helping other people, we ought to also look at uh, can, can we have an impact? So I, I just throw that out there. Certainly, yeah. So d d basically, the, the, the white incandescent, incandescent lighting is the worst for birds. Um, and for some, we don't know why they're attracted to it, but they are. And so, you know, with the lights out initiatives, you know, to reduce lighting um, that's, that's you know, not needed, like the exterior lighting of like the lighting up the sides of the building, obviously we need safety lighting on, but anything you can reduce will certainly reduce those issues. So. Excuse me, Mr. Schron, is your mic on? Or the LED could give you... Uh, a better result than using the Florence Florence. I'm not sure, but I would say that it's still white light. So any white light is still going to be more um, more problematic than the the red lights would be. Well, you can adjust the the LEDs and make them not white. Uh, okay, is my, yeah. Is my point. So you that, can make them a cream color. You can make them. You sure. can also make them a yellow, almost from that standpoint. Okay, yeah. And it, and it might serve the safety issue on the yellow. And and uh, I'm just throwing it out because uh, when when you're in the innovative stage. You don't have a right answer. You just look for innovation. Sure. Yes. I, I do know uh, that that's what uh, Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse is is trying. They have installed different colored lights to, to go down and are, are using those as movement. And I don't know their success rate at this point. And I apologize. I forgot to introduce uh, Mike Campo, our assistant general manager for the convention center. And Mark Jekovic, our director of operations, we're all uh, involved in, in uh, coming up with these solutions. Thanks a lot. So, what's your time frame again? So, you have the um, Mr. We should, we should have the report within the next two to three weeks. Uh, that will go immediately to the CCC FTC board for their consideration. Uh, the timeline from there is really up to the board. I think we're going to miss the spring migration, unfortunately, but. Yeah, I, oh. I, I don't know, you know, if we will or, or not. It's going to be tight. Yeah, it's going to be, it's gonna be tight. tough. So, you know, as long as we're moving forward and by fall, those events especially are going to require the events those seem to stickers. Be, and, yeah. Okay. The events um, seem to be the biggest issue. Well, the Global Center, too, that one side is really bad. But I think this is all can be remedied. I appreciate you coming in. And so when you get that report, I'd like to see it. Absolutely. In two to three weeks. And yes. Um, we'll move forward with, you know, we, we've invested money in the expansion of, of that facility and hope that this would be incorporated in. And I came in a little late with it, but any new construction now that comes before this body, I'm going to make sure that we at least look at the potential um, harm. It, for example, Sherwin-Williams, before it, it was constructed, was able to address right. what could be a really bad but, well, situation. I can tell you, part of this consultant is looking at that expansion. And, and coming up with mitigation strategies for the expansion as Ron well. Williams. Yep. And, and Rocket Field Mortgage House, I did meet with them. And it, it, part of this is, too, it's the timing of the lights. Even if it's for a short window, um, you know, around the dawn, they go right. off. There's no reason. You know, for the decorative lights, they're like, well, during games, we want them on. That's not really the problem, the sweet spot. It's, it's later on when it really shouldn't even matter. So, okay, really great about the update. I appreciate you coming in. Thank you so much. Good to see you guys. And we'll talk to you in about three weeks. Thanks. Okay, um, we do have minutes now. We have a quorum. Okay, I'm, that's okay. No, you came in. We can do it. Um, so can I have a motion to approve the minutes from January 18th? So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, those um, minutes are approved. I have nothing further. And, and just one quick update on Say Yes to Education. Last night, or Monday night, the city of Cleveland voted to uh, allocate $600,000 one-time ARPA investment into Say Yes to extend it to, you know, maybe July. But there's no plan after that how to proceed after July. I just wanted to give that update. So we're hoping that, 
all the partners are going to come together the school year. We did meet that um, expectation, 22-23 school year. County was able to carry them through May almost to, you know, June, and now they're good till July. So I'll keep you updated on what's happening. And that was a one-time allocation of ARPA dollars from the city. Okay, thanks, uh, Councilman Miller, for coming to this. Adjourned.